Chapter Seventeen of the Widow Married: A Sequel to the Widow Barnaby by Francis Milton Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seventeen: Splendor succeeded by enjoyment, an important arrival, an unexpected visit, more family feelings, the mischief of a young woman added to that of an old one, its consequences whatever might have been the degree of enjoyment produced by mrs o'donagough's party whilst the whole company remained together it certainly ended in unmixed satisfaction to those who remained after general hubert's carriage drove off mr o'donagough's feeling of enjoyment probably arose in a considerable degree from knowing that the thing was over the miss perkinses cordially pressed to fall upon the ices which no degree of skill could preserve not only luxuriated in their dulcet coolness but in all the pride of having passed the evening in such society and all the relief produced by its having departed but the happiness of mrs o'donagough and patty was of a more substantial kind they indeed also at ice and were not insensible to the delight of pulling off their gloves and feeling easy as they all designated their present state of enjoyment but beyond this both mother and daughter contemplated results the most lasting and important from the events of the evening mrs o'donagough determined to be very cautious and diplomatic and to say nothing to nobody but she also determined that her own daughter should come to as great honour as the daughter of her sister and marry a hubert unless she could do something better patty who looked perfectly intoxicated with delight as she meditated on all that passed between herself and her cousin came exactly to the same conclusion the only difference being that her reservation was in favour of jack while that of her mamma had reference to any lords who might chance to fall in her way the hubert party said very little to each other about the visit in any way perhaps mrs compton would have thought she had done enough to punish her dearly beloved general for all the pertinacy he had shown in making light of her prophecies had he but uttered one single word indicative of dislike to the o'donagough race in general or to any individual among them in particular but he said not that word agnes feared to lead the subject lest a species of covert warfare which she perceived to be still going on between her husband and her aunt might be excited thereby and as for compton feeling conscious that he had been superabundantly impertinent he secretly rejoiced that the adventures of the evening seemed to lie under an interdict which rendered all allusion to them impossible his sister elizabeth indeed found an opportunity to ask when they were alone together what he thought of their australian cousin and he replied by giving her just such a description of the evening as might have been expected from so saucy a personage several excursions on sea and land immediately followed during which the o'donagoughs were in truth very nearly forgotten it was exactly one week after mrs o'donagough's party at half-past five o'clock in the afternoon that mr and mrs o'donagough miss patty the two miss perkinses and lieutenant dartmoor being all seated very comfortably at dinner in the drawing-room were startled and as it were dragged involuntarily from the table to the windows by the most tremendous clatter upon the pavement that it was well possible for horses and carriages to make who in the world are these cried miss matilda to lieutenant dartmoor beside whom she was so lucky as to be placed three carriages and four and two outriders mercy what a dust liveries green and gold well i should like to know who they are stop a moment i think i can tell you replied the lieutenant protruding his person almost at the risk of his life through the open window in order to obtain the information required yes i thought so i remember the arms because of the crest it's the stephensons they are first-rate dashers i promise you we had them here last autumn and they made the whole place alive stephensons what stephensons demanded mrs o'donagough in a tone of authority tell me captain dartmoor all you know about them i entreat you i have an interest in that name which nobody else in company can have except indeed my own daughter do you mean frederick stephenson brother of sir edward yes ma'am those are his carriages i give you my word everybody knew the set-out last year there was never a day that they were not making parties or picnics or something or other several of our officers were always invited when they had dancing their arrival will make a sensation through the whole town gracious heaven was ever anything so fortunate now mr o'donagough i shall have the pleasure of introducing you to some more of my connections you must remember frederick stephenson at clifton that is i mean you must remember my often talking about knowing him there perfectly replied mr o'donagough gravely reseating himself at the table 
and no wonder you should have often mentioned him as a gay personage if that is the style he usually travels in he is a man of immense fortune and such a dear creature said mrs o'donagough addressing miss perkins and smiling as with a sort of tender recollection of past days he is an old acquaintance then said miss matilda with nervous eagerness old acquaintance bless you my dear he is one of the nearest relations i have by marriage and coming here unexpectedly in this way well to be sure you are fortunate mrs o'donagough are you not delighted patty no not i replied the young lady i don't see the good of having relations if one never sees em i'm sure the huberts might as well be at jericho as at brighton for anything we see of em how can you talk such nonsense patty said her vexed mother when you know that we have called there three times since the delightful evening they spent here and have always heard where they were gone they have always been driving into the country somewhere or other to amuse my aunt compton i suppose and people can't be in two places at once let them wish it ever so much that's true i'm sure if ever anything was observed miss perkins with energy the very nearest relations in the world can't always be as much together as they wish and after what we saw the other night my dear miss patty you can't persuade us but what there's one of the party that wouldn't be very far from eastcliff if he had his own way come come louisa perkins no tales out of school if you please let me give you a little more irish stew to stop that mouth of yours replied mrs o'donagough laughing never mind her patty don't blush about it cousins will be cousins all the world over it is all very well to talk of drives into the country said the judicious matilda taking her cue from mrs o'donagough's evident delight in the subject it is all very possible nevertheless people often throw dust without blinding the lookers-on i saw what i saw and i know what i know the general didn't marry so very young himself remember and i suspect his opinion is that young folks ought not to be too much in a hurry there may be something in that matilda replied mrs o'donagough nodding her head sagaciously we must not talk anything about it yet captain dartmore remember that this is all among friends and must go no further did stephenson play when he was here inquired mr allen o'donagough addressing his military friend oh yes i believe so was the reply he did everything rode races gave balls bespoke plays got up raffles there was something or other going on the whole time they stayed and if you inquired let it be what it might you were sure to find that the stephensons were at the bottom of it what delightful people exclaimed miss matilda why yes replied the lieutenant looking towards mrs o'donagough it would be a good set to get into certainly but the worst of it is said mrs o'donagough with more dignity and reserve of manner than was usual with her the worst of it is that these sort of people are so very exclusive near relations of course are accepted but frederick stephenson dear good-natured fellow as he was and always particularly kind and flattering to me even before he married my niece's half-sister even he was always rather famous for giving himself airs a gentle sigh heaved the bosom of matilda miss louisa looked very grave and shook her head and the lieutenant seized the decanter of mazooka or martola or pontac or bondac or whatever the mixture might be called which stood near him and swallowed a glassful of it the result of a certain consultation held that night between mr and mrs allen o'donagough on the subject of this important arrival was that another call at general hubert's house must be made on the following day where if they were not admitted they might at least obtain intelligence as to the truth of lieutenant dartmoor's information the o'donagough trio set off accordingly at a proper visiting hour on the following morning dressed one and all with more than usual care and determined that if it were possible to avoid it their trouble should not be in vain is mrs hubert at home was the first question at the general's door the servant hesitated and mrs o'donagough instantly made a movement in advance i particularly wish to see my niece if it only be for half a moment my mistress is just going out ma'am replied the man standing rather pertinaciously in the doorway it is only for one moment and upon family business of importance said mrs o'donagough making another step in advance before which the man retired of necessity but without quitting the handle of the door perhaps ma'am you would be pleased to leave word that you would call again said the servant what do you say mr o d suppose we do and fix the time exactly and then we shall be sure of seeing her do just as you please my dear replied mr allen o'donagough it will make no difference to me 
only he added in a whisper you may as well ask about the stevensons then we will call again exactly at five o'clock to-day please not to forget the message james i think your name is james i am pretty sure i heard my niece call you james yes ma'am my name is james well then james i must insist upon it that my message is delivered exactly a message from your mistress's own aunt you know ought not to be neglected give agnes give your mistress i mean my most affectionate love and miss o'donagough's love and mr o'donagough's compliments and say that we shall call again precisely at five o'clock yes ma'am said the man advancing a step in his turn and bringing the door with him stop one moment if you please said mrs o'donagough laying her palm firmly on the outward side of the door can you tell me james if the stephensons arrived yesterday frederick stephenson i mean who married your mistress's sister you know the man looked rather surprised either at the question or the manner of it but answered yes ma'am and where are they of course they can't all be here three carriages servants outside and all no ma'am they went directly to their own lodgings then please to give me their address directly mr stephenson has taken blank house ma'am the same he had last year blank house whereabouts is it do you know blank house mr o d mr o d did not but the servant gave the full address and at length succeeded in shutting the house door now then let us go there directly cried mrs o'donagough it is no good beating about the bush let us take our chance at once if they choose to be civil why so much the better and if not why we can't help it and the sooner we know it the better to this reasoning mr o'donagough made no objection and after toiling a considerable distance through unmitigated sunshine somewhat to the injury of his lady's rouge and not much to the advantage of his daughter's temper they at length reached the handsome mansion to which they had been directed mr o'donagough stoutly pulled the bell more stoutly than the well-hung instrument required and the tintamare thus produced occasioned an instantaneous throwing wide of the folding doors disclosing to the dazzled visitors a handsome hall which at the first glance seemed half filled with livery servants the green and gold recognized by lieutenant dartmoor was indeed there and in great abundance but set off with such richness of plush and profusion of lace and tassels that the great soul of mrs allen o'donagough almost felt daunted till that moment she had conceived that the establishment of general hubert was perfectly splendid but thenceforward she rarely named the family without observing that nothing could be more unpretending and quiet than their manner of living merely a butler and two footmen besides the coachman and grooms but always adding that to be sure nothing could be more striking than the contrast between the two sisters in their style of doing things the establishment of her brother willoughby's second daughter being really almost royal in its magnificence an answer in the affirmative being returned to their inquiry if mrs stephenson were at home their names were received and passed from mouth to mouth till the sound of mr mrs and miss o'donagough made the lofty staircase ring again mrs o'donagough with an effort worthy of her powerful mind immediately recovered her self-possession and gracefully shaking her plumes marched up the stairs in unblenched majesty mr o'donagough followed looking as demure as a newly created bishop while the young lady with wide staring eyes and a countenance indicative of something approaching dismay closed the procession on reaching the drawing-room door mrs o'donagough paused for a moment till her husband and daughter were beside her and then stepped forward determined that nothing short of her being turned out of the room should prevent her establishing her claim to connectionship with all the grandeur she beheld the first room they entered was exactly in the style of decoration most likely to enchant the senses of mrs o'donagough being of that florid character which is calculated to ensure a rent of forty guineas per week at a watering-place as it was untenanted she ventured to exchange an expressive glance with her husband but the man in green and gold stalked on and another pair of folding doors being thrown wide open before them disclosed a room with an immense semicircular window opening upon a balcony which commanded a magnificent view of the sea in this balcony stood two gentlemen the one arranging a spy-glass on its trellis-work for the accommodation of the other while a third whom patty instantly recognized as her cousin compton was assisting a little fellow in a fantastic fancy dress composed of blue silk and white muslin to climb in the most dangerous manner possible to the roof of the frail construction 
close beside the window on a couch placed perfectly in the shade though all without was sunshine reclined nearly at full length an extremely delicate-looking little woman with a profusion of light ringlets about her face her robe of the finest muslin lined with the prettiest shade of pink was profusely decorated with lace her small feet accommodated with quilted satin slippers of the same pale colour and her slender fingers sparkling with gems employed luxuriously in arranging a bouquet of flowering myrtle and gorgeous geranium blossoms this pretty and very picturesque lady raised a glass to her eyes as the strangers were announced let them have been whom they would she could hardly have risen so difficult would her attitude and the multitude of flowers in her lap have rendered the attempt had she made it but this she did not do and her eyeglass failing to supply the information which their names did not convey she turned it from her visitors to the servant who had ushered them to her presence and pronounced the word who this was not promising any more than the puzzled air with which after the name had again been distinctly pronounced she shook her head and in a soft and somewhat lisping voice added i fear there is some mistake i cannot be surprised at your not knowing me my dear mrs stephenson said mrs o'donagough pushing away a little work-table and placing herself close to the sofa but i think you must have heard your sister agnes mention her aunt perhaps you may recall the name of barnaby mrs barnaby oh dear yes certainly replied mrs stephenson slightly colouring and slightly smiling at the same time i have heard of you very often is that tall lady your daughter pray sit down sit down sir with a wave of the hand to mr o'donagough which seemed to indicate rather a more distant part of the room for his station then turning to a flaxen sylph of some ten or twelve years old who was threading beads she said go out agnes and tell your papa and your grandpapa that mrs barnaby is here no longer mrs barnaby my dear madam give me leave to introduce mr o'donagough my husband and miss o'donagough my daughter oh dear yes i beg your pardon i remember all about it now you went out to india did you not as a widow i quite remember hearing mr stephenson speak of the widow barnaby and you married in india i suppose here mrs stephenson again conveyed her glass very unceremoniously to her eye and reconnoitred first mr o'donagough and then his daughter mrs o'donagough herself being too close to render it necessary though in truth she was exceedingly near-sighted i dare say she continued still employing her glass that my father will remember all about you directly and i'm quite too happy you have called i wanted to see you so very much it is sweetly kind of you i am sure to say so said the delighted mrs o'donagough no wonder that i should long to see you i shall always consider your dear father as my brother and one of his children must of course be as interesting to me as the other i am quite certain that in a very little while my own dear agnes my own sister's child would hardly be dearer to me than yourself you are the very image of your dear father so like what i remember him at silverton the still youthful-looking face of mrs stephenson was during nearly the whole of this speech completely buried in the large bouquet she held in her two hands nor did she speak again till in obedience to her summons mr willoughby and mr stephenson entered from the balcony then raising to them a pair of laughing eyes though her manner was perfectly grave and ceremonious she said papa this is mrs barnaby the late mrs barnaby i mean frederick i believe you used to know her too her name is now mrs donago she has come to call upon us with all her family is it possible exclaimed mr willoughby coming with outstretched hands towards his sister-in-law indeed i am very glad to see her i hope you are well my dear martha and with a kind and gentle smile he attempted to take her hand but this was not the species of salutation in which mrs o'donagough's warm heart as she was wont to describe it most delighted no dearest willoughby she cried after such an absence let us meet as we parted at silverton with a sisterly embrace the gentleman of course complied but sighed as he felt his own slight person lost as it were and buried in the majestic vastness of that of his sister-in-law and remembered how very different were the circumstances of the two moments she thus placed side by side the operation completed however he resumed his quiet and gentlemanly kindness of manner gave two fingers to the extended palm of mr allen o'donagough upon that person being solemnly presented to him and kissed without waiting to be asked the blooming daughter of his recovered relative 
mrs o'donagough with her usual quickness immediately saw that of all the great and grand connections amidst which her happy destiny had thrown her mr willoughby was the one to stick to with the least chance of being shaken off she felt that he was her sheet-anchor and round him she determined to swing let the wind blow from what quarter it would while these introductions and embracings were proceeding mr stephenson and compton hubert stood silently watching them the former with his usual unwearied spirit of gaiety determined to administer to the amusement which the eyes of his wife the only portion of her face that was visible showed she derived from the scene and the latter only waiting till his grandfather had concluded his civilities to miss patty in order to renew his own acquaintance with her mr stephenson speedily perceived that there was no need of any interference on his part in order to put the well-remembered mrs barnaby in action for the amusement of his wife neither did it seem to him at all necessary on the present occasion to put in play any portion of that fund of good-humoured persiflage in which his nora delighted for the purpose of bringing forth to view miss patty's claims to the same species of notice inasmuch as his young friend compton appeared fully adequate to the task therefore having bowed a smiling acknowledgment to mrs o'donagough's affectionate recognition he sat himself down so as to command a full view of the whole party and of his wife's eyes into the bargain it required but a slight glance from time to time to perceive that however absurd there was nothing very new in the flirtation going on between the young people every feature of the case being essentially the same as must ever occur when a bold boy is encouraged in his audacity by a coarse-mannered girl but not so mrs allen o'donagough her energetic affection her laughing ecstasy at their present reunion and her weeping softness over the days that were gone her modest insinuations of her own genteel independence and the joy she anticipated from watching with true sisterly affection his present affluence contrasted with mr willoughby's somewhat embarrassed but always polite manner of listening to her formed a tableau of no common kind and one from which a less laughter-loving pair than the one before whom it was performed might have found amusement at length it seemed to strike mr stephenson who notwithstanding his too boyish love of mystification was really good-natured that mr o'donagough was left rather too much in the background and turning abruptly round to him he said won't you take a look at our fine view mr o'donagough this is the most commanding window in brighton mr o'donagough immediately rose and with a not very unskilful assumption of gentlemanly ease walked towards the window it is perfectly magnificent he said and it is unique no other mansion in brighton is so happily situated that is very true sir said mr stephenson rising and following him out upon the balcony we have been fortunate enough to get this house three years running frederick stephenson was one of those happy-natured people who loving his wife and children heartily loved also only in a somewhat less degree all the other goods with which the gods had provided him and wanted no warning voice to bid him think them worth enjoying but liked well nevertheless that all around him should perceive and acknowledge what a particularly happy fellow he was in all respects had mrs o'donagough been within reach of watching her husband during his conversation with mr stephenson on the balcony she would have found that she did not know him so well as she fancied she did and that there were still some aspects of his proteus-like nature which had never been exhibited to her with the cautious avoidance of all subjects that might prove dangerous mr allen o'donagough now conversed like a man of the gay world who knew perfectly well how to appreciate so accomplished a personage as mr stephenson with the rapidity which is usually acquired by persons that not only possess their wits but live by them he contrived to form a tolerably correct estimate of the strong and the weak points of the gentleman's character before he parted from him while at the same time he left on mr stephenson's mind a persuasion that he was a remarkably clever well-informed man and that it was quite wonderful how he could ever have married such a ridiculous person as mrs barnaby their colloquy and their acquaintance might have proceeded still further had not mrs stephenson got tired of watching mrs barnaby and her father and miss barnaby and her nephew which happened the sooner from no longer having her husband's eyes to answer the appeals of her own for a time indeed her young daughter who forsook her beads and changed her place for the purpose of watching the odd-looking strangers supplied his absence tolerably well by the very intelligent looks which she exchanged with her mamma for it was not part of the family discipline to deny the younger branches their fair share and participation in all the enjoyments of quizzing but the young lady after having seen enough to enable her to mimic both mrs and miss donago satisfactorily ran off to the schoolroom to puzzle the french governess and delight her sisters by the performance 
soon after her exit mrs stephenson withdrew the sheltering myrtle from her face and freely yawned but neither mrs nor miss o'donagough saw it they were both too happy too elated to observe it the graceful lady then changed her position on the couch and with an air of pretty restlessness threw aside her flowers took a book yawned again and finally rose from her attitude of repose and despite her fear of freckles sought her husband in the balcony e troppo caro she whispered in his ear mr stephenson immediately broke short the conversation in which he was engaged by saying to his wife as he took her arm to lead her from an atmosphere which he knew she dreaded you are come to remind me nora of my engagement are you not i must beg you to excuse me mr o'donagough i am obliged to go out and must therefore wish you a good morning if you will leave your card i will certainly have the pleasure of calling on you the observant mr allen o'donagough took the hint and re-entering the room gently admonished his wife upon her seeming forgetfulness of the flight of time my dearest o d can you wonder at it she replied her eyes and her cheeks glowing with enthusiastic sensibility think of the years which have elapsed since my dear brother-in-law and i have thus sat side by side together can you not imagine how it must bring back the memory of my beloved sophia such moments are too delicious to be measured mrs o'donagough slowly rose from her chair as she spoke and what with feathers veil floating mantle of stiffened muslin and her own august expansiveness it struck mrs stephenson that she had never seen anything so large in her life before and she seemed to shrink up into her own delicate miniardise as if anxious to increase the contrast mrs o'donagough stepped towards her with an extended hand but the fair nora had no mind to be shaken and glancing up an appealing look to her husband which he perfectly well understood she retrograded a step or two at the same time bowing her farewell while he advanced took the large hand in his own much smaller one and atoned for all his lady's deficiencies by a voluble repetition of good-bye mrs o'donagough good-bye good-bye though frederick notwithstanding all his good-nature shook the huge hand very much as if he wished to shake it off mrs o'donagough held fast till in a half whisper she had murmured something very tender to him about the memory of clifton and past times then determined to emulate the elegant retreating movement of mrs stephenson she began backing out of the room bending deeply forward at every step like the head of a ship in a too fair wind and reiterating good morning good morning good morning till she reached the door mr o'donagough was so glad that it was over and as he felt well over that on throwing open the door of communication between the two drawing-rooms for his daughter and wife to pass he slipped by them as if the more quickly to ensure his own retreat on reaching the landing-place however and finding himself again amidst the impressive troop of green and gold officials he remembered that he was not making his exit according to the established rules of etiquette and turned round to make way for his wife and daughter to pass before him it was with a feeling little short of dismay that he found that they were not as he imagined close at his heels and on casting an orpheus like backward glance into the rooms he perceived that his wife was not half set free for she was still in the inner apartment in fact while backing out of the room with her husband and daughter following mrs o'donagough had totally lost sight of and forgotten her slender brother-in-law but no sooner did she perceive him again upon the removal of mr o'donagough's person than it struck her she had not properly taken leave of him and rushing back again she very liberally threw her arms around him for her fond hands met behind his back and impressing a not silent kiss upon his cheek exclaimed good heaven was i indeed going without uttering a sister's farewell to you dearest willoughby let us soon meet again i have no words to express the happiness i feel in your society and then as frederick nora and the young compton had all taken refuge in the balcony she turned about quitted the room with a rapid step seized upon patty's arm who was left staring in the doorway rejoined her husband and with happy and triumphant feelings descended the stairs which as she owned as soon as she had left the house she had mounted an hour before with her heart in her mouth she is gone positively gone nora so come in out of this scorching air said mr stephenson after carefully reconnoitring the apartment thank our stars replied his wife falling as if exhausted upon the sofa it is a very hot day said mr willoughby rising from a chair into which he had sunk when mrs o'donagough withdrew her arms from his person very hot and oppressive indeed i think nora i will go into my own dressing-room and lie down upon a sofa a little 
but don't let any of the dear children come to me for i feel very much overcome and fatigued so saying the gentle kind-hearted mr willoughby languidly withdrew and soon fell fast asleep without having even whispered to his own heart that his affectionate sister-in-law had nearly talked and hugged him to death are they not curious people aunt nora said compton as soon as his grandfather had quitted the room curious oh heavens replied mrs stevenson with a profound sigh and then she stopped as if unable to articulate another word the girl is handsome though isn't she demanded the youth adding with a shrug but to be sure she is most horribly vulgar handsome you have the face to call that monster handsome compton how hideously ugly you must think us all your mother and sisters included no i don't aunt but there are more styles than one you know do stop him frederick for mercy's sake do not let him talk of styles with that fearful creature in his thoughts do you explain to him what style means will you his mother has a style and i have a style of of appearance i mean but to use such a phrase to her really looks as if he did not know the use of language it is perfectly disgraceful dearest frederick for pity's sake tell me must i ever endure the sight of those people more upon my word i am afraid so nora was the unsatisfactory reply remember that they are nearly related to your sister agnes and in fact very nearly connected with your father how will it be possible to avoid your seeing them then you must make up your mind to my dying frederick for as to my enduring existence under circumstances resembling those of the last three hours it is perfectly out of the question well then dear we must contrive to vary the circumstances as much as possible the sight of that great woman amuses me more than i can express it is a sort of lesson in natural history to watch her as she is now and remember her as she was some dozen and a half years ago or near it i would not give her up for more than i'll say and compton's love too with her large face bright cheeks and brighter eyes they are treasures perfect treasures in their way see what it is to be a philosopher sighed forth mrs stevenson resting her head on the arm of her couch and applying a bottle of salts to her nose you are too sublime for me frederick you are indeed if you will be a good girl replied her husband laughing and promise not to die about it i will let you off easy promising only to indulge my scientific speculations now and then how she contrived to get him i cannot guess but madame barnaby's husband is really a very well-behaved sensible man oh was uttered by mrs stevenson with another profoundly deep suspiration of forced breath come nora said frederick make the best of it i am certain your father will be vexed dear good man if you declare open war upon this unfortunate race my father nay frederick it is too good to quote him against me when you have this moment seen him take to his bed sick of the barnaby however let us talk no more about them or decidedly i must go to bed too ring the bell dear will you and order some open carriage or other i die for fresh air by the way frederick do you think that large lady will ever kiss me i give you warning you will never see me alive again if she does every possible precaution nora shall be taken to prevent it and we will keep compton always in readiness to act as your deputy should the thriving offspring of the large lady attempt anything of the kind you will not refuse compton to perform this vicarial service for your aunt the boy coloured tossed his handsome head and yielded to the solicitations of his young cousin to return to the balcony and set him climbing again where will you drive nora inquired mr stephenson when the carriage was announced to see agnes and consult with her how best to guard against the inroads of this horde of savages do so my dear by all means she will counsel you very discreetly depend upon it when the sisters met there was as usual a very free exchange of confidential communication between them mrs stephenson declared that her curiosity being satisfied she felt nothing but terror at the idea of any familiar intercourse with mrs donago and that somehow or other she must find means to prevent to all this agnes listened without surprise but when in her turn she dwelt upon her own embarrassments from the same source and related all the circumstances of the general's half-playful warfare with mrs compton on the subject the feelings of nora underwent a sudden change 
notwithstanding a firm foundation of genuine liking and goodwill there was often a considerable difference of opinion on many subjects between the high-minded and dignified yet simple-mannered general hubert and the capricious and affected though affectionate little beauty his sister-in-law she had quite sense and right feeling enough to be conscious of his high worth and often in her graver moods acknowledged his superiority to everybody in the world but her husband yet she dearly loved to contradict him and to make him feel in spite of all his wisdom that the very folly of a pretty woman has power in it she was moreover wont to declare that his wife spoiled him and that all he wanted to make him perfectly agreeable was a little well-organized contradiction the tormenting process which the venerable mrs compton seemed to be now making him undergo for the express purpose of proving that he had been wrong secretly delighted mrs stephenson she listened to every word concerning it with deep attention comprehended perfectly the game which both parties were playing and immediately determined thoughtless of consequences to eke out aunt betsy's efforts to prove that the general had blundered by every means in her power of this new whim she gave no hint to agnes but parted from her with a gentle promise to endure the donago infliction as patiently as she could had it not been for this unfortunate vagary on the part of mrs stephenson it is probable that all serious annoyance from the o'donagoughs would have gradually died away from the positive difficulty of keeping up anything like friendly intercourse between persons so every way incongruous but for this the ci-devant major's ambitious projects would have gradually sank into a humbler sphere his wife would soon have preferred talking of her darling agnes to enduring the restraint of her presence aunt betsy would have grown weary of the sport and so would master compton too while it can hardly be doubted that general hubert himself would have gladly suffered the discordant connection to be placed on a proper footing according to mrs o'donagough as much consideration as might be granted without inconvenience to his own family but no more that all this was most devoutly to be wished nobody felt so strongly as poor agnes but unfortunately in this case neither her judgment nor her conduct could avail to check the mischief produced by the frolicsome thoughtlessness of nora the easy pliability of her husband and the sort of compunctious weakness with which poor mr willoughby permitted himself to be persecuted by his first wife's sister as a sort of atonement for his deeply repented neglect of her child all this worked together so effectually that before the end of a fortnight the mischief had got so far ahead of them as to produce a perfectly good understanding on the subject between general hubert and mrs compton both cordially confessed they had been wrong and most cordially united in deprecating the consequences of it but unfortunately they were no longer capable of stopping the movement they had put in action mr o'donagough without making the slightest attempt to lead stephenson to play contrived to discover that in the winter he had no sort of objection to it and meanwhile by innumerable devices to make himself useful and even agreeable to him with as much genuine coarseness he had infinitely more tact than his vulgar wife and was in truth so able an actor that with an object of sufficient importance before him he was capable of sustaining many characters extremely foreign to his own stephenson soon believed him to have been the most enthusiastic sportsman the most enterprising naturalist and the most benevolent speculator who had ever visited new south wales and listened to his unbounded lies with undoubting confidence till at length he became fully convinced that despite the peculiarities of the barnaby he had found a very valuable acquaintance in her husband and that at the time when everybody was talking of the country with interest it was really very pleasant to have picked up a man who probably knew more about it than any one else in england it was exactly the sort of thing frederick stephenson liked enabling him to get in the van of information without the bore of reading interminable books and endless quarterly articles upon it and in short mr allen o'donagough was soon on such excellent terms with the rich stephenson that he dined with him twice in one week and might most days be seen walking and talking with him on the pier for an hour together this intimacy went on the more prosperously because mrs stephenson contrived in her usual easy style to perform her part of the mischief she was so thoughtlessly promoting with very little inconvenience to herself she called once or twice on mrs o'donagough but as her carriage had two or three children in it she could not leave them and therefore only sent in her card and when these visits were returned it was poor mr willoughby who had to converse with her the inviting mr o'donagough to dinner of course did not include the ladies of the family 
yet the talking of it served extremely well to show the general that his friendly reception of his wife's aunt had already entailed the connection upon them and in addition to this nora more than once amused herself by inviting patty to pass the evening when compton was engaged to dine with them a device which produced a display of coquetry on the part of the young lady so comic as repeatedly to make her forget her fine ladyism in hearty laughter at the remembrance of it it was by dilating a little too maliciously upon this in the presence both of general hubert and mrs compton that the foundation of a perfect reconciliation between them was laid no sooner did they find themselves alone together or at least with agnes only for a witness than they both as by common consent pleaded guilty to great folly in permitting compton to amuse himself in so objectionable a manner and the ice once broken nothing could be more frank than the sincerity with which each declared themselves to blame but unfortunately it was much easier to confess the fault than to remedy it and so insidiously did mrs o'donagough contrive to turn every accident to profit in promoting the intercourse between the cousins that at length the old lady suddenly declared her intention of returning immediately to compton bassett and taking her young heir with her for the purpose of giving him some shooting upon his own manner this was conferring a degree of pre-eminent dignity upon the boy which both father and mother under other circumstances would have been very likely to disapprove but now no objection was made to it and the scheme was immediately decided upon the bright eyes of miss patty could by no means stand a competition with partridge shooting with his own dogs and the youthful lothario mounted on the coach-box of aunt betsy's carriage dashed past the abode of his bell and waved his hat so gaily to her and her mother who stood together at the open drawing-room window that though little was said between them on the subject both felt that spiteful aunt betsy had achieved a tour de force which disappointed many projects the mother consoled herself by remembering that the horrid old woman could not live for ever and the daughter found solace in a long recapitulation of jack's love-making on board the atalanta during a long walk on the cliff with her faithful friend matilda the departure of compton and to say the truth the departure of aunt betsy also were under the present circumstances a considerable relief to general hubert nevertheless the o'donagough plague was far from being put an end to by it agnes was still perpetually pained by witnessing the annoyance endured by her father under the persecutions of his affectionate sister-in-law it was mr willoughby's habit to ramble out every morning when at the seaside immediately after breakfast sometimes leading one grandchild with him and sometimes another mrs o'donagough soon became acquainted with this fact and from that hour the unfortunate gentleman was never permitted to inhale the breeze he loved without having her closely fastened to his side though neither his spirits nor his frame were particularly robust he might perhaps have endured this daily annoyance with greater fortitude had it been confined to the operations of her tongue as she walked beside him but always conscious that of all those upon whom she hung for the gratification of her ambition he was the one who would endure the demonstrations of her love most patiently she never relaxed in her determination to make the most of him this led to such heavy hangings on his arm such lusty tappings on the back when she had hunted him into the public library and so many other wearying tokens of affectionate familiarity that though he complained to no one his life positively became a burden to him and it was only because he thought somebody or other would guess the reason and think he was unkind to poor sophie's sister that he did not at once take to his bed in order to get rid of her the only person who did guess the reason of his languid looks and altered spirits was his daughter agnes and the idea having once suggested itself there was no great difficulty in testing its truth and convincing herself that it was well founded as soon as she became quite sure of the fact she pointed it out to her husband who secretly reproached himself much more severely than he confessed for having been so greatly the cause of it these feelings d'un part et d'autre soon led to the anticipation of a scheme long ago projected but not intended to take place till the following year general hubert's eldest son had gone through eton school with such brilliant rapidity as to be ready for college at least two years before his father wished to send him there during this dangerous interval he had himself determined upon being his tutor and by taking him on the continent with his mother and sisters hoped to assist essentially the formation of his moral character while giving him the advantage of modern languages and extensive travelling in this scheme mr willoughby had been always included he had already repeatedly visited italy and had so uniformly found himself in better health on the continent that nothing but his averseness to leave his daughters and their children induced him to reside in england 
had general and mrs hubert wanted any confirmation on the subject of mr willoughby's weariness of brighton they would have found it in the manner of his receiving their proposal for immediately leaving it for france when every member of a party is cordially desirous of promoting a scheme and ample means exist to facilitate its being carried into execution it is wonderful how much may be done in a little time mrs hubert miss wilmot and the two girls with their attendants almost immediately crossed to dieppe under the escort of mr willoughby while general hubert who it was settled should join them at paris returned to london for the purpose of settling everything previous to his leaving england and arranging the movements of his son montague upon his finally quitting school old mrs compton had been long prepared for this separation and was comforted under it by compton hubert's promising to make compton bassett now become a very handsome residence his principal home during the vacations while to its taking place somewhat earlier than was intended she was perfectly reconciled by the motive for it End of chapter 17chapter eighteen of the widow married a sequel to the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eighteen natural antipathy and strong affection necessity owns no laws but her own the miss perkinses own this solemn truth and prepare to leave brighton friendship makes an effort to prevent it but fails lights and shadows of love notwithstanding the sudden departure of general hubert and his family the memory of their greatness like the light diffusing tail of a comet remained behind them and mrs o'donagough continued to be a person of unquestionable importance with all her brighton acquaintance the circle indeed was not a large one her affections as she observed to every member of it having been too much centred on her own relations to leave her leisure for cultivating the miscellaneous friendship of the world at large i know this is not right said she i am quite aware that it is one's duty to be condescending and civil to everybody but with me it is always the heart that speaks and it would be in vain to attempt struggling with my affection for my darling niece mrs hubert and her dear family they have made me positively neglect everybody else but i cannot help it those who know her will appreciate the attraction and forgive me while by those who do not i must submit to be accounted fastidious exclusive and most abominably proud mr o'donagough who when he was not meditating on matters more important would frequently derive considerable amusement from listening to his wife now and then indulged in a little quiet quizzing at her expense but she had too much good sense to take a great deal of notice of it and generally contrived indeed to end by having much the best of it in her own opinion one point on which he particularly liked to attack her was on the change in their relative positions as to their intercourse with the stephenson family he remembered their first visit and the secondary party had acted upon that occasion which he loved to contrast with the one now allotted him i cannot think how it is my dear that you see so very little of your own near connection mrs stephenson while i am got so pleasantly intimate with her husband but it seems really as if you counted for nothing with them said he the reason for that is plain enough mr o'donagough i cannot abide that little idiot woman in fact i perfectly hate the sight of her odious doll lolling almost at full length in her open carriage just to make everybody stare at her with a dozen children like so many monkeys stuck up behind and before to make up the show don't agitate yourself my dear resumed the gentleman in a mild voice though i cannot greatly wonder at your feeling vexed she really takes no more notice of you than if you were no relation at all and considering how remarkably affectionate you are to all your cousins it must be very trying you may keep your pity to yourself mr o'donagough and if you fancy i am affronted you were never more deceived in your life besides you mistake the matter altogether the fact is she is all but blind poor thing and i don't choose to be always bawling after her as the carriage drives along but it is most preposterously out of the question to suppose for a moment that she would dare to cut me well my dear i dare say you know best but sometimes it looks very like it nonsense o'donagough cut me indeed when her own father dear affectionate creature perfectly dotes upon me he treats me a thousand times more like a sister than a sister-in-law and bless him i love him in return as a real sister should and so he shall find i can tell her as soon as he comes back to england for let him be where he will in town or country i am quite determined to be near him people as sincerely attached as we are cannot bear to be long parted 
some weeks more of fine autumn weather passed away during which the o'donagough family and their little coterie continued to enjoy the sea breezes in each other's society in the most fashionable manner some desultory conversations occasionally arose between the ci-devant major and his lady as to what they were to do and where they were to go next on all these occasions mr o'donagough permitted his wife to talk almost as much as she liked without uttering a word that deserved the name of contradiction but though she laid down very plainly what he had best do and what of course he would do and what it would be perfect madness if he did not do the subject always came to a close without leaving her at all wiser respecting his real intentions than when it began meanwhile patty was enjoying herself greatly for though as she ingenuously confessed to her friend matilda she had no one beau in particular there was not one of the set except foxcroft who did not make a little love to her whenever they had the opportunity but a heavy blow was about to disturb her tranquillity the miss perkinses having by this time in the most ladylike and respectable manner expended the sum whatever it might have been destined for their marine excursion had been one morning looking anxiously over all their little accounts and had reluctantly decided that it was quite time to return to their first floor at bellevue terrace prompton for the remainder of the passing year and the first seven months of the next they had just mutually exchanged the melancholy words yes we must go when their beloved patty with her accustomed vehemence of vivacity bounced into the room what a hateful bad day it is for the glass she exclaimed rushing to the window which a driving rain from the south-west had obliged the sisters reluctantly to close not a soul to be seen in the sea or out of it isn't it a bore alas my dearest patty replied miss matilda vexing as it is to see the rain fall so i have got something at my heart worse than that why you haven't seen foxcroft go by without looking in or anything of that sort have you replied the sympathizing young girl with a significant smile no patty no not that i really don't believe there is any danger of it replied matilda with a heavy sigh poor foxcroft poor dear fellow he little thinks how soon all our delightful evenings in that dear drawing-room upstairs will be over over echoed patty why what's in the wind now the route isn't come is it not for him patty but it has come for me what do you mean matilda only too truly what i say dearest think what i feel when i tell you that my sister has received a letter from london this morning which renders it absolutely necessary that we should return home immediately stuff and nonsense replied patty i should like to know what there is to make you two go if you choose to stay what's the good of being old maids of course i don't mean you matilda for i really don't believe you will be one in the end but what's the good of having nobody in the world belonging to you if you can't stay when you please and go when you please business my dear you know must be minded said miss louisa rather mysteriously well then let miss louisa go by herself said the lively patty she is old enough to walk alone and i neither can nor will be left here without you to walk with matilda you shan't budge a step till we go too dear darling creature exclaimed miss matilda in a burst of enthusiastic fondness while a delightful hope flashed through her mind that it was possible mrs o'donagough to please her daughter might ask her to remain as their guest after her sister went so overwhelming was this sudden hope that it almost choked her and pressing both her hands upon her heaving breast she looked in the face of her young friend with the most touching expression imaginable patty inherited a considerable portion of her mother's acuteness and saw in a moment what her friend had got in her head the idea accorded perfectly with her own inclination which would have prompted her at once to offer the half of her own little bed rather than be left without a friend and confidant but she remembered her papa and remembered too the cold meat dinners which frequently graced their domestic board so she prudently restrained her hospitality and only said stop a minute matilda i want to speak to mamma and you must not stir till i come back again darling girl i know what she has gone for exclaimed the agitated matilda as soon as the door was closed oh louisa i shall be perfectly wild with joy if she succeeds i do assure you very seriously that i think foxcroft means to propose to me you need not shake your head so gloomily my dear i know you are thinking how often i have been disappointed before but certainly no one can be so good a judge as myself what his manner is besides louisa if the o'donagoughs invite me i should like to accept it whether i am right or wrong about foxcroft 
but this i will say that if he really does mean nothing it is better for my peace of mind that i should find it out at once and if i do find him to be such a villain i shall soon cease to care about him i can promise you that you may depend upon it my dear i shall spend nothing not a single sixpence after you are gone excepting about eighteen pence a week for my washing while the ardent matilda thus pleaded her own cause below stairs her faithful friend was not less eloquent above she had however a tougher listener to deal with so here you are together that's right said she as she entered the drawing-room with an assured step and confiding spirit i have got something that i want to say to you both and what may that be miss bright eyes demanded her father i'll tell you in no time replied the young lady approaching him but please to remember papa that this time you must let me have my own way or you and i shall be too indeed and pray what's in the wind now what do you think both of you of the perkinses being going away no are they indeed cried mrs o'donagough never mind patty we shall not be long behind them added her husband but i don't choose to be behind them at all papa replied the young lady that's nonsense patty i won't have you go trying to fix their starting for just the same day as ours i don't want to have my travelling ways spied into by anybody and that i should have thought you might have known by this time oh yes papa i know all that of course but as i have chosen matilda perkins for my particular friend she must not be counted as anybody and what i have come for now is to say that you must let me invite her to stay behind her sister and sleep with me you shall do no such thing miss patty i promise you replied her papa and if you have got into the scrape of asking her with your eyes shut you may get out of it as you can with your eyes open and now come here he continued holding out both his hands to invite her approach i have something to say to you patty felt a prodigiously strong inclination to snap her fingers and run out of the room but she fortunately gave a glance at the expressive countenance of her parent and then walked quietly enough towards him placing her hands in his now then martha o'donagough he said listen to a word or two and take my advice when i tell you to remember them i never will now or ever suffer any human being man woman or child except servants to enter my house as an inmate you are but a baby miss patty with all your cleverness as to the ways of the world or you would understand the wisdom of this but whether you understand it or not remember it and remember too if you please that though i give you free leave to make as many friends as you like and talk to them early and late of your bonnets and bows i will lock you up upon bread and water as sure as you stand there if i ever catch you uttering a single syllable about me or my house or my friends or anything that i do or anything that i say don't fancy patty that i shall not find it out i have not lived for nothing my dear and what i want to know i generally get at first or last ask your mamma mrs o'donagough though possessed in no common degree of the courage and confidence produced by the consciousness of great mental power and no woman could have a much higher idea of her own ability felt nevertheless something exceedingly like awe as she now listened to her husband she often indeed felt that she did not fully comprehend him that there were still many peculiarities in his character that she could not quite make out and that although as she constantly assured herself and patty she was not in the least bit afraid of him some feeling which she could not exactly describe generally in all their little disputes led her to the conclusion that it might be as well not to defy him it was this which made her when thus appealed to immediately answer mind what he says to you patty there's a good girl of course he knows best and when he speaks in earnest as he does now it would be very silly and wrong not to mind so say nothing at all patty to matilda about staying i can't say i should much approve it myself she has always seen everything about us quite genteel and what's the good of letting her know what we like to do when we are quite by ourselves besides patty you must see that she is getting so intimate with foxcroft as to be sure of telling him just everything and i have no notion of that the officers have always seen us in the most agreeable manner possible and what with my clever little suppers and my dear relationship to the general it is sure and certain that we count for people of consequence with them which may be a great advantage to us all let us meet them where we will that's enough and to spare mamma said miss patty venturing to bestow upon her female parent the sulkiness generated by the decision of her father for pity's sake don't go preaching on any longer if i mustn't have a friend to speak to i mustn't and there's an end of that 
only i hope we are not to stay much longer in this beastly stupid place i am as tired as tired of it and with these words the young lady made her exit slamming the door after her with considerable energy she had no great difficulty on reaching the parlour again to read on the countenance of her friend the hopes and expectations to which her own sudden departure had given rise and spite of the lecture she had just received she scrupled not to confess that she had asked for leave to invite her and had been refused her manner of confessing this however showed the species of inherited talent she possessed as much as it did her filial obedience to the spirit as well as to the letter of her instructions i would have given anything matilda to have got you to stay with me she said but mamma's notions are always so grand about everything that she won't ask you because she hasn't a fine handsome bedroom to put you in oh dear me i hope she would not mind that with such an intimate friend as i am exclaimed the affectionate matilda almost sobbing with eagerness there's no good thinking any more about it my dear replied patty decisively it's no go and all because of the bedroom being little rejoined matilda with a groan oh patty i'd sleep upon the floor with a blanket around me with joy and gladness that i would yes patty or without a blanket either rather than go away from you that i would the excited feelings of the disappointed lady here overpowered her and she burst into tears it is folly and nonsense crying about it matilda said patty with less of sympathizing softness than her friend might have wished that's not my way they never make me cry now let them do or say what they will i always get my own way when i can and when i cannot which isn't often i just snap my fingers at them and take pretty good care to get something else out of em before i've done miss matilda here took miss louisa aside to the farthest corner of the room and consulted her in a whisper as to the possibility of her continuing to occupy their present bedroom for a week or two longer my dear child replied the tender-hearted elder sister there is nothing i would not do to help you but you know we have reckoned the money over and over and that there will be when all's paid but just enough to take us to our own door and not a penny to spare i wish to heaven you had not bought that blue silk gown matilda there is no good in taunting me with that now louisa i had the best of motives for it and it is cruel to throw it at me at the very moment too when i am within such a hair's breadth of making it answer dear dear louisa do try to help me think what a thing it would be for both of us if i was to marry what can i do matilda replied the elder i can't do miracles you know but after a moment's consideration she added there is but one way i can think of and that's one i don't like at all i suppose we might leave the shoe bill till next year good heavens to be sure we might replied matilda with recovered spirits and suddenly giving her sister a most cordial kiss there is nobody of any fashion as we all know who does not leave bills everywhere then suddenly approaching patty who despite the unfavourable state of the atmosphere was employed as usual in making experiments with the telescope and addressing her in a tone that expressed both tenderness and gaiety she said my darling patty i do positively think it would break my heart to part with you a single hour before i was absolutely forced to do it and louisa says that of course i could keep on my own bedroom if that was all considerably alarmed by this pertinacity which appeared very likely to bring her into a scrape patty replied rather abruptly yes my dear but it is not all papa is every bit as proud as mamma and he says that nothing in the world should ever make him invite any one to stay with us without having any servants footmen you know and all that so it is no good to say any more about it but my dearest patty surely such a friend as i am say no more about it i tell you matilda but run and put your things on and come down to the pier it does not rain a drop now to signify and i am pretty sure i saw foxcroft and willis cross over as if they were going that way it was with a heavy heart though with a rapid step that the unfortunate matilda ran upstairs to comply with this request and mournfully desponding was the voice in which she murmured to her friend as they walked along oh patty if we should meet foxcroft how shall i bear to tell him that we go on monday you must make the best of it my dear that is all i can say replied her friend but step quicker matilda there they are as i live just going upon the pier now they must have stopped somewhere or other since i first saw them the eyes of patty had not deceived her on reaching the pier they found the two gentlemen she had named beguiling their superabundant leisure by leaning over the wall and watching a distant ship or two through the haze of course the young ladies expressed some surprise at seeing them 
so then you are no more afraid of a scotch miss than we are said patty giving her parasol to mr willis while she tightened the strings of her too fragile bonnet anything is better than staying boxed up at home replied the young man and i suppose that's your idea miss patty as well as ours i suppose it is answered patty but i don't intend to stand still shivering like this i shall walk up and down just as fast as i can trot well then you had better give me your arm or upon my life you will be blown over said mr willis while mr foxcroft offered his to her companion in the most touching of manners namely without saying a word which always seems to indicate that protection on the one side and dependence on the other is a matter of course between the parties patty and her companion chattered away at a great rate but mr foxcroft and miss matilda perkins walked on for several paces without exchanging a word the lady's heart was beating violently and the gentleman's head was at work when an unmarried officer of the line is very hard up it is by no means an unusual thing that he should turn his thoughts towards matrimony but when conscious that his last birthday left him within a lustre of half a hundred and that his hair is a dapple between red and grey he confines himself if he be wise to the minor prizes in the market takes a special care that there be no fathers or brothers in the way and is particular about nothing save the certainty that the lady has got something and that this something is at her own disposal at the moment above mentioned lieutenant foxcroft was turning in his head all the facts which had reached his knowledge tending to throw light on the financial concerns of his fair friend mr o'donagough had shown himself perfectly ready to give all the information he could to which friendly openness he was perhaps in some degree prompted by the fact that mr foxcroft owed him a debt of honour amounting to seventy-three pounds but in truth his knowledge of the miss perkins's concerns was not sufficient to justify giving advice on so important a point and the brave lieutenant felt that he must be his own pioneer this naturally gave something of restraint to his conversation while on the other hand the collected tenderness of thirty-six years in a bosom peculiarly prone to receive soft impressions produced a swelling fulness in the heart of miss matilda which for a considerable time rendered it impossible for her to speak a word at length lieutenant foxcroft became fully aware that there was something dangerous in this protracted silence and preluding the words with a slight cough he said <clears throat> what a very unpleasant day for the seaside it is it was with a sigh which an actress might have taken as a model that miss matilda replied very again they were both silent when the lady perceiving by the green drops that trickled from her parasol upon her bosom that it would probably soon rain too hard for even patty to continue her promenade determined that the precious moments which were passing should not pass in vain and struggling to subdue the vehemence of her feelings that she might speak distinctly she said captain foxcroft this is i suppose the last walk that we shall take together at brighton my sister and myself return to our london home on monday they had just reached that end of the pier which abuts upon the sea as this annunciation concluded upon which the lieutenant stood stock still and though the barrier against which the waves were rudely breaking was cold and wet the agitated matilda gladly availed herself of the support it offered and regardless of the smart silk scarf that perished in the act she placed both her arms upon it and remained with her eyes intently fixed upon the ocean the news she had thus communicated considerably startled mr foxcroft and plunged him in a very disagreeable dilemma for he was by no means ready to act upon it in any way he would indeed have been vastly imprudent had he committed himself either by declaring a passion or pronouncing a farewell for while on the one hand the lady's evident independence and equally evident partiality urged him forward his ignorance of the amount of what he might gain by proceeding kept him back his conduct under the circumstances was in every way judicious being in fact the result of great experience and a thorough acquaintance with all such matters after a pause which told matilda quite as plainly as any words could have done that her news had almost annihilated him he said is it possible it is indeed she replied with expressive emphasis another pause followed in what part of that vast wilderness will you be hid my dear matilda said the lieutenant with a truly military sigh we live at brompton was the softly whispered reply of course our friends the o'donagoughs will always know where you are oh yes she answered while her heart was torn by conflicting joy at this proof that he meant to inquire for her and grief at perceiving that whatever might be his future intentions there was for the present no hope whatever of a declaration 
such being too clearly the case and the rain now falling in such torrents that patty and mr willis had taken to their heels and ran home not without a little joking upon the tete-a-tete -tete at the pier head such being the case miss matilda perkins made up her mind to turn round and walk home likewise but even in that wet dirty dismal moment hope lingered at her heart and she determined to try what one honest open unmitigated look of tenderness might produce the circumstances of her position were favourable to the experiment for the plentiful moisture which encumbered her hair gave her face a sort of forlorn and melancholy look of which she was not wholly unconscious and which she thought might serve her better at such a moment than the tightest curls but alas there are some natures upon which the innocent little trickeries and pearly tears of tender woman fall like soft dewdrops on the sturdy oak they may glitter about it nay sometimes shine almost like a glory around its lofty crest but not a fibre is moved thereby nothing could be more expressive more intelligible more heart-searching than was this look of matilda perkins but it was in vain as well might cannon be expected to startle a well-trained charger as such a look to shake the firmness of lieutenant foxcroft this is a subject painful to dwell upon and it is enough to say that the two sisters departed by the stage on the morning appointed without carrying with them any consolation whatever for the imprudent purchase of the blue silk gown End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of the widow married a sequel to the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nineteen the o'donagough family travel back to london and are snugly lodged a judicious exhortation patty turns musical and meets with an adventure another six weeks completed the period for which mr o'donagough considered it advisable to remain at brighton and due notice was given to his lady and daughter that they were to pack up their faded finery and be ready for starting the o'donagough policy as to the most advantageous mode of performing a journey had not undergone any alteration since their arrival and therefore exactly the same process was gone through to restore them to the metropolis as that which had brought them from it having chosen rather a late coach they reached the renowned white bear in very proper time for dinner but mr o'donagough for reasons of his own preferred ordering luncheon after which he once more set out in quest of a home for himself and his family his absence on this occasion was very short for it being the latter end of october lodgings were not difficult to find and in less time than it would have taken most people to think about it he had packed himself his lady his daughter and all their baggage into a hackney coach you must neither grunt nor grumble turn sulky nor look cross said mr o'donagough as soon as the vehicle drove off if you don't happen to like the lodgings i have got for you they are cheap and that's the reason i take them i don't intend that you should either see or be seen much for the next two months or so and i desire that you will make up your minds to it at once what does he say mamma inquired the terrified patty turning to her mother for what with the wheels and the steps and the windows she had heard this speech but very imperfectly what does papa say about our not being seen hold your tongue patty being the only answer she received the young lady turned to the window let down the glass and for the next five minutes found great consolation from meditating on the impossibility of not being seen if she lived in a place where such throngs filled the streets as were then jostling each other before her eyes at the end of that time the equipage stopped at the door of a small private house in one of the narrow streets that steal away and hide themselves right and left of the splendours of regent street the aspect of the dwelling was not very inviting from without nor was the prospect greatly improved when the door opened and displayed its size colour and various other properties within but mrs o'donagough entered and neither grunted nor grumbled turned sulky nor looked cross her whole manner and appearance indicated the triumph of reflection over impulse and of wisdom over weakness she quietly followed the dirty little maid who opened for her the front parlour door and permitted her eye to take a catalogue of all it contained without suffering her tongue to utter a syllable of commentary thereon not so miss patty the contrast between this dwelling and that she had left at brighton was too much for her strength and she exclaimed in no whispered accents mercy upon us mamma you don't mean that we should live here 
fortunately mr o'donagough was at that moment wholly occupied in assisting the coachmen to drag their trunks and boxes into the narrow passage which they so completely filled that he was induced to offer the man an additional sixpence upon condition of his giving him a hand to get them upstairs to their sleeping apartments at once a promptitude of arrangement which was rendered expedient from the total impossibility that any animal more bulky than the dirty little maid should get in or out of the house without climbing over them the interval thus occupied gave mrs o'donagough an opportunity of bestowing a few words of very excellent advice upon her daughter my dear patty said she there is no doubt in the world that this is the very horridest den that ever man brought a wife and daughter to and i too with such relations as i have but you see how i bear it and take my word for it there is no good in contradicting him just at this time i am quite sure he has got something or other working in his head that makes it convenient i don't mean to say but what if he would trust the whole management of everything to me i might have contrived to do all he wants done and kept something like comfort about us besides but men will be men patty all the world over worse luck to all this patty made no other reply than a grunt the evening passed as such evenings generally do a family group placed in lodgings of which females greatly disapprove but which being chosen by the male must be endured seldom manifest any striking symptoms of hilarity fortunately however patty was very sleepy and fortunately too perhaps mrs o'donagough remembered that she had more than one box to open before all the nightcaps could be found so it did not last long and before ten o'clock the eyes of the whole party were closed in sleep as sound as the circumstances of their location were likely to permit poor patty's boasted beauty did not show to advantage the next morning and to do mr allen o'donagough justice it must be confessed that he looked at her with some concern but as his wife had very correctly observed he had something working in his head which rendered their remaining in obscurity for a month or two exceedingly convenient and therefore being a man of considerable firmness of purpose he had not the slightest intention of altering his plans though he perceived that one of the bright eyes he so much admired was almost hid by the swelling which distressed her cheek and the other as dull dim and heavy as if the light which usually blazed within it had been suddenly put out but notwithstanding the steadiness with which he retained his resolution of keeping the ladies of his family in this perfect retirement he yet felt good-humouredly disposed to support the young lady's spirits under it if he could and therefore while her mother was engaged in the rooms above he drew a chair towards the recess beside the fireplace where in a slippery tall horsehair arm-chair poor patty sat ensconced and thus addressed her you don't like this so well as our gay lodgings at brighton do you darling what do you ask that for papa replied the young lady i should think you might guess without my telling you and so i can patty but you can't guess i'll bet a guinea you can't what's going to happen to you next the telling such a young lady as patty that something is going to happen to her almost invariably suggests the idea she is about to be married and so it was in the present case the swelling on her cheek did not for alas it could not disappear in a moment but all other obscurations of her beauty vanished as she exclaimed good gracious papa what can you mean what have you got in your head now patty replied her father laughing you don't think i'm going to give you a husband do you how should i know returned the pouting patty no my darling it is not that yet said he assuming a more serious air i wouldn't for more than i'll say that my girl should be mated before she has got her best feathers on you shall be something and somebody i can tell you before i have done but then you must let me manage matters my own way my dear i have had great misfortunes in my time patty or i might have been as rich and as grand as mr stephenson and that was the reason why i went over to such a cheap and prosperous country as australia but things are going better with me now again and if you'll be a good girl and wait patiently without any expense till the proper season for gaiety begins you shall see what i will do for you and it is not giving up much either for there is not a single soul in london now my goodness papa how you do talk replied the indignant patty more affected by this last statement than by anything which had preceded it why twas a perfect crowd that we drove through last night and if you would but take lodgings in some street where i could look out of the window and see the people i should not care for anything almost you are too humble-minded by half my darling replied mr o'donagough checking her under the chin you shan't only look at the people but all the people shall look at you if you'll let me have my way without grumbling the people you saw last night patty 
we're nothing but a parcel of clerks and milliners girls who have no longer anything to do in their shops because all the fine folks are out of town i don't care what they are replied his daughter with great animation i am sure they were as handsome and elegant looking as possible and at any rate it must be better to see them than that nasty old dustman there with his horrid bell patty said her father gravely you are not half so quick and clever as i fancied you were i thought i had made you understand how being careful and saving at one time could enable one to be grand and gay at another but you talk now like a mere child and if you go on so i must treat you as such i suppose you really are not old enough yet to comprehend the advantage of this sort of management yes but i am though replied patty tartly and i'll be bound for it if you would tell me just once for all what you will give us to spend in a year i'd manage to show off with it quite as well as you and never set us down in such a nasty dark dull place as this neither just for all patty won't do for me there is no need to enter with you into any long explanation concerning my affairs girls can't possibly understand the subject nor women either for that matter because they are never brought up to it so i hope neither your mother nor you will torment me with any questions but be contented with what you can get and thankful that you belong to a man who never leaves a stone unturned if he thinks he can find money under it but i suppose i may walk out sir said the little pleased patty almost blubbering yes you may walk but i should very strongly recommend you both not to show yourselves now pranked out just as i hope you will appear when i am receiving lords and baronets at my house you will do yourselves a monstrous deal of harm by it i can tell you but i believe it is easier to stop the wind from blowing than a woman's ribbons from flapping at this moment mrs o'donagough entered the room and instantly perceiving from the countenance of the young lady that something was wrong she ventured to say in an accent which did not manifest any decided determination to take part with either what's the matter now i have only been giving miss patty a hint or two as to the patient endurance of a cheap lodging till i see right and fit to put her into a dear one said mr o'donagough you had better leave her to me donny replied his lady whatever i tell her is right that she will do that's more than i'll promise unless i happen to like it said patty recovering her vivacity and giving so saucy a wink with the eyelid still under her command as to throw her father into an ecstasy of laughter come come that's all right again if my beauty does not get into the sulks we shall get through the next two or three months in no time and then you shall blaze away both of you as you never blazed before said mr o'donagough adding in a rather mysterious tone you have no notion yet either of you what i have got in my head to do for your pleasure and profit but if i hear any grumbling it will spoil all mind that if you trouble me now or ever with questions observe i speak to both of you alike if you trouble me now or ever with any questions whatever about my goings-on or what i mean to do or what i mean not to do by jove i'll take myself off you are able to get at your own money now my barnaby he continued in an accent of perfect good humour as well as before you married me and i give you credit for your cleverness but one advantage of this is you know that you can do without me now don't fancy either of you that i am angry or want to get rid of you for i don't quite the contrary if things go as i wish my wife and daughter will count for something so come and kiss me patty and remember that the better you behave the smarter you shall be when the fine folks come to town again it would have been difficult for mr o'donagough or any gentleman under similar circumstances to have pronounced an harangue more calculated to obtain the objects he desired had he scolded they would probably have scolded again had he blustered they might have rebelled but promises threats and mystery together formed a chain most admirably calculated to lead ladies captive and even before any opportunity had been given for them to consult together both mother and daughter had respectively made up their minds to behave well i think i will sit down at once to my satin stitch patty said mrs o'donagough it's always wrong to waste time that cloak will be perfectly magnificent if ever i live to finish it and it is likely enough that it may be useful to you or to me one of these days and if i was you darling i'd set about turning that pretty green silk dress that the sea faded so abominably it will look as good as new patty if you do the job nicely yes i will replied patty almost meekly and dutifully turning her steps towards the door to seek the employment suggested but before she opened it she ventured to turn her head and say 
do you think mamma we shall be able to get any novels to read upon my word my dear i don't know was mrs o'donagough's discreet reply glancing at the same time a look of civil inquiry towards her husband novels to be sure you may lots replied mr o'donagough gaily i'm going out and if you'll sit down to your needles i'll find out the nearest circulating library for you and subscribe for three months and will you bring back something papa said patty yawning as she turned her eyes towards the one window which though it commanded an uninterrupted view of the window opposite had little else to recommend it i will if i can but you must not expect me directly i have too much to do to turn errand boy just now my beauty you and your mother can stitch together for an hour or two i know without coming to the end of your talk why you have got to hash up all that happened at brighton and when that's done and over you may begin upon what you shall do and what you shall say and what you shall put on some three months hence when you will be living in style and state again replied mr o'donagough patty shrugged her shoulders but left the room without a word strong evidence that his judicious eloquence had not been thrown away upon her when she returned to it with thimble needles cotton box and scissors in one hand and a huge mass of miscellaneous trumpery in the other she found her mamma alone and already deeply occupied by the magnificent cloak pray do you intend to bear this mamma said patty as soon as she had drawn toward the only movable table in the room and placed it near the window do you really intend to go on bearing this quietly bear it how am i to help bearing it replied mrs o'donagough sharply as if you did not know girl that i have no more power to help myself than this needle has where i choose to push it there it must go and where he chooses to put us there we must stay and if you know any cure for it i hope you will tell me that's all ain't these leaves perfect patty i am sure i shall hang myself if it is to last for three months rejoined her daughter without indicating the least emotion at sight of the perfect satin stitch mind i give you fair warning mother i shall either hang myself or run away and pray miss patty why do you not tell your papa so instead of trying to bother me worse than i am bothered already demanded mrs o'donagough why just because you are the gentleman's wife ma'am and ought to be able to manage him to be sure replied patty but do you think if i was to fall sick it might do any good she added very gravely no my dear not the least in the world replied her mother he's tiresome enough and tyrant enough too sometimes but to give him his due i don't believe that what he is doing now is for the sake of teasing us i am sure he means to blaze away as he says by and by in fine style and i don't know but he's right patty after all for i'd rather ten times over live hugger mugger fashion as we are now if it's only to last for a time and then show off afterwards than go on on for ever the same just decent and respectable and never making people wonder or admire from first to last ay ay mamma that's all very true and i understand it just as well as you do but you'll please to remember that i'm in my teens and that what's mighty easy to you is just like death and distraction to me mercy upon me only fancy me staying on for three months at one go in a dark linen frock and without a man young or old tall or short handsome or ugly to look at me i know i can't bear it i know i shall be after some prank or other to help myself i wish you would mind what you are about patty and not talk so wild replied mrs o'donagough who with the increasing wisdom of advancing age was able to pursue her work tranquilly even though she too was in a dark linen dress and conscious that under her present circumstances she could look neither like the beauty she had been nor the woman of fashion she was i wish patty said she that you would be more steady at your work remember my dear that you are growing taller and stouter every day and if you don't mind you'll notch these turnings in so in the unpicking that you'll never be able to make the frock up again big enough to get into do mind what you are about i'll tell you what ma'am replied the lively girl if you take to scolding i'm off i'll be hanged if i won't walk up and down the street before the door if you make this little pigsty too hot to hold me and so saying she pushed her work from her and throwing up the dusty sash thrust out her head to reconnoitre the promenade to which she threatened to betake herself my goodness she exclaimed drawing it back again after taking a melancholy survey up the street and down the street what a nasty hideous hole we are got into the air smells of nothing but dust 
and there isn't a soul to be seen except an old man driving a cabbage cart and two dogs drawing a barrow with dirty rags and old bottles in it yet even these objects appeared to have more attraction for the weary patty than the operation of dress-turning for again she thrust forward her head and remained for some minutes without changing her attitude at length she drew back a step while such a blush suffused her fair and ample cheeks as might have convinced her mamma had she chanced to look up that something besides the cabbage cart and the wheelbarrow had met her eye at the same moment a short sharp knock at the door was keenly audible through the open window that's your father come back i suppose said mrs o'donagough no it isn't replied patty did you see who it was then demanded her mother i saw it was a man and not a bit like papa responded the young lady in a whisper and at the same moment she went to the parlour door and partially opened it so as to permit her peeping out without herself being seen he must be the first-floor lodger for he came in and went straight upstairs without saying a word said patty retreating from the door with her face in a blaze and pretty well he squinted at our door as he passed but i'm sure he saw nothing of me but my nose i suppose he saw you through the window miss said her mamma but you mustn't stare out into the street that way in london i can tell you that's because the street is so monstrous gay i suppose replied her daughter hadn't you better put me on blinkers mamma come come patty shut down the window and settle quietly to your work or upon my life and honour i'll tell your father what a plague you are said mrs o'donagough and much good you'll get by that won't you mamma replied patty however i'll settle down presently if you won't make a fuss but i must go upstairs first for i have forgot something and so saying she ran out of the room without waiting for a reply the heiress of mr o'donagough was no great songstress but for some reason or other she took it into her head to be musical as she walked deliberately up the stairs singing cherry ripe very distinctly if not very skilfully and the consequence was that just as she reached the first-floor landing the door of the front room opened and a tall olive-coloured man with enormous black eyes and a prodigious quantity of hair to match became visible at it patty started ceased her song somewhat hastened her step and passed on but not so rapidly as to be unconscious of her fellow-lodger's politeness for he bowed profoundly and looked at her with his widely opened great eyes as if he admired her very much on reaching her own apartment which was the back room of the second floor she seated herself with some degree of agitation on her trunk lord how i wish matilda perkins was here murmured patty as soon as she had in some degree recovered her breath and her composure i'll bet a guinea she'd make a good guess in a minute as to what sort of chap that is what eyes he's as dark as an indian but he's monstrous handsome for all that and i'm sure he's a gentleman from his bowing so beautifully this soliloquy was thought not spoken and it was silently that patty sat revolving in her altered soul the possibility of amusing herself even there if she could but get at her dear friend to help her after a few moments thus spent she arose determined to attack her mother and her father too firmly and with proper spirit on the absolute necessity of her having somebody to speak to and the atrocity of which they would be guilty if they would not give her leave to set off that very day for bellevue terrace brompton in search of her friend matilda in pursuance of this resolution she re-entered the parlour with a slow and steady step which had something grave and determined in it she seated herself silently at the table resumed her work and for some minutes remained opening seams and picking out threads so demurely that her mother though at that moment particularly engaged in newly adjusting her pattern looked up to see what she was about but perceiving her serious air only said there's a good girl just keep on in that way till dinner-time and the worst part of your job will be over mamma said patty solemnly i am not thinking of my job and why not for goodness sake i'm sure you can think of nothing better patty how beautiful the colour is where the sun hasn't come you'll have a lovely frock again if you will only take a little pains it is no good to talk to me of frocks and colours said patty in a voice of sedate melancholy while you are making me as miserable as you do now i am quite sure i shall do some mischief to myself if you and papa persevere to keep me on this way without a single soul to speak to i tell you fairly mamma i can't bear it and i won't what do you expect to get by flying at me patty said mrs o'donagough with considerable symptoms of irritation it is no good putting yourself in a passion mamma 
replied patty with very impressive quietness i am sure i am in no passion myself what i feel has nothing to do with temper or anything of the kind i have been thinking very seriously about it everybody must know themselves better than anybody else can know them and i feel quite sure that i shall not live or at any rate that i shall go out of my senses if papa goes on with me in this way i dare say there are many people who could do it better than i can and i am sure i wish that i was like them for papa's sake and for yours for i don't want to vex either of you but i am as nature made me you know and i can't help it good gracious patty how grave and solemn you do talk cried mrs o'donagough looking up at her with all the surprise and some of the alarm which the young lady had intended to produce what on earth would you have me do my dear i would wish to be as watchful over you as ever mother was i never did think of myself at any time of my life everybody that ever knew me would do me the justice to say that and it is hardly likely that i should be less generous and devoted to my own daughter than to other people but i no more know how to get you out of this place before your father chooses to take you than i know how to turn copper into gold it is not altogether the place that i hate so much mamma replied patty i dare say i should have sense enough to get the better of that but it is the being so dreadful dull and solitary without a single friend in the world to speak to i should be perfectly contented if you would only let me go and see matilda perkins i am sure my dear patty i should have no objection if it depended only upon me though i can't say but what i should feel a little small at being seen in such a place as this by people who have met general hubert at my house however i could easily make up my mind to bear that for your sake my dear and i can't but say it would be a comfort and some sort of relief too for me to have that good creature louisa to speak to now and then especially if your father would let me tell her that we were going to be dashing again by and by but how can i tell what he may say to it patty all i can do is to promise i'll be no spoke in your wheel and if he chooses to ask my opinion i'll take care it shall go the right way i'm not going to ask you mamma responded patty with a deep sigh i have made up my mind to speak to papa myself and i know perfectly well what i shall say to him but i suppose it will be hours before he comes back i wish you would put up your work just for a few minutes mamma and take a turn with me up and down the street i'm sure i don't care about going any further i only want a little air don't you think it is very close here yes i do indeed and when i think of poor dear brighton i positively feel half choked i really think a little walk will do us both good and mrs o'donagough began to roll up her work very well then cried patty briskly i'll run up and put my things on and this time as she mounted the stairs she sang the merrier roundelay of i won't be a nun i can't be a nun i am so fond of pleasure that i must not be a nun again a manly step was heard to traverse the little drawing-room again the door opened and once more the olive-coloured stranger appeared at it respectfully bowing as before when he beheld the young lady passing before it on perceiving this patty felt convinced that in common civility she was bound to return the salutation and she did so by smiling blushing shaking her curls and bowing her head a quarter of this abounding gratitude would have sufficed to assure the spanish language master for such he was that not alone the bright valleys of his own sunny land were peopled by dark-browed and very benignant young ladies but that even the chilling blasts of the norse could not prevent the effect of a wandering hidalgo's eyes if he did but know how to use them having gained her apartment patty placed herself before the glass and laughed at her own blushing image there as she recollected the looks of profound respect and admiration which it had just called forth she waited not to consult her mamma as to which of her three bonnets she had best put on lest her father's doctrine respecting the eligibility of occasionally adopting the obscure incognito style should be pleaded in mitigation of feathers and flowers and long before mrs o'donagough's majestic person had reached the altitude at which she herself stood patty was already decked in what she considered as her most becoming finery good gracious my dear how smart you are i had no notion you meant to put on your best bonnet i am sure if your father sees us we shall catch it you know what his notions are about that matter patty said the dutiful wife and watchful mother i don't care a straw what his notions are mamma replied her daughter 
when i have got a good thing i shall wear it whenever i think fit you don't suppose that papa intends to make such a bessy dingle of himself as to tell us every morning what clothes we are to put on before night do you my goodness patty how you do chop and change about exclaimed mrs o'donagough have i not heard you tell him over and over that you admired his plan of being shabby and saving when we were out of sight well and so i do answered patty colouring a little but in london one can never be sure that one is quite out of sight you know not aware how special an observation this was mrs o'donagough permitted it to produce considerable effect for she laid aside a shabby old shawl in which she was about to envelop herself and substituted one of scarlet which had been purchased expressly for the brighton campaign and now being fully equipped they set off patty descending the stairs not only without singing but without suffering the patter of her feet to be as audible as usual nevertheless the olive-tinted stranger who seemed to be the most watchful and attentive of language masters heard enough to bring him to his door and somewhat to the young lady's dismay his dark visage and enormous eyes appeared exactly at the moment when mrs o'donagough was passing it it seemed that the encountering an old lady instead of a young one was more than the gentleman's nerves could stand for he instantly stepped back and closed the door there is some truth in what you say patty about london one never can tell who may be there and who may not i am monstrous glad i have got my scarlet shawl on were the words uttered by mrs o'donagough as she descended to the street door but they did not at all reach the ear of her daughter and the gentle damsel nestled to the side of her parent as they commenced their walk eager to hear the observations which the apparition of the sable head might give rise to he must be an african or a chinese patty or something of that distant kind i should guess resumed mrs o'donagough as they walked on yet i can't for my life help thinking that he is monstrous handsome though he is so near being a blackamoor did you get a peep at him at who mamma said patty innocently at the lodger on the first floor my dear didn't you see the door open as we came down i suppose it was while i was running upstairs for my pocket-handkerchief replied patty well then you must contrive to see him some day or other child for it is the most remarkable face i ever beheld i should not wonder to hear anybody say that he was horridly frightful and yet for the life of me i can't help thinking him monstrously handsome i am sure mamma i should like to see him of all things replied her daughter but i don't know how i can't walk into his room you know laura mercy no returned the mother with great animation i beg and desire patty that you won't speak in any such flighty way about him i am quite certain he is not the sort of person for any nonsense of that kind if he lodges in the house you will be sure to see him sooner or later i dare say without playing any mad pranks to contrive it patty received this rebuke in silence and walked on it had been her intention when inviting her mamma to take the air to cross the street and parade up and down leisurely on the other side of it thereby giving an opportunity to the first-floor gentleman to see them out of the window if he liked it but she was too sensible a girl to persevere in this project now and they languidly pursued their way to regent street first streaming along to the top of it and then down again nothing could be a greater proof that the mind of the fair patty was preoccupied than the indifference with which she gazed into the shop windows but with her mother it was otherwise notwithstanding the stifling heat and dust of a fine october day in london mrs o'donagough's energies all returned as she contemplated the glories faded and waning as they were which every step presented to her view oh patty she exclaimed at length what are you thinking of did you ever in all your days see anything so heavenly beautiful as these shops just look at those coloured muslins how they do make one long don't they to be sure they do replied patty roused at last and throwing as it were all her recovered soul through the plate-glass barrier that separated her from the objects in question but it makes one sick and miserable to look at them without a single sixpence in one's pocket i declare i'd rather be dead than going on as i am now this melancholy reflection and her own pathetic expression of it recalled to the memory of the fair mourner the necessity of managing ably her projected attack upon the heart of her father and no sooner did she think of this than the injury which her gay dress might produce should they chance to meet him struck her forcibly let us go home now mamma said she in a tone of great depression and fatigue upon my word i am so tired i can hardly stand 
mrs o'donagough could willingly have walked and gazed a while longer but she yielded to this urgent entreaty and they returned in time for patty to prepare herself for the reception of her papa there was considerable cleverness displayed in her manner of doing this she knew she could not turn pale and she was very sorry for it but all she could do she did she pushed back her redundant locks behind her ears and made them hang as disconsolately as their nature would permit she practised before the glass a sort of heavy heart-broken look dressed herself in a dirty faded suit and then crept downstairs so quietly as to escape the keen ears of the spaniard whom she by no means wished to encounter in such a trim having placed herself in an attitude of great weariness and dejection she awaited her father's return in such pertinacious stillness that she very nearly fell asleep but he entered at a favourable moment real heaviness assisting that which was assumed and giving her the appearance of being in a very deplorable condition mercy on me patty what's the matter with you exclaimed mr o'donagough i hope he added turning to his wife that she is not going to have the smallpox or measles or anything of that sort have you got a headache my dear yes papa my headache's very bad replied patty in a gentle voice i believe people have always got the headache when they are as miserable as me miserable why what have you been doing to her mrs o d you haven't been scolding and badgering her i hope you know i don't approve of it and i won't have it no dear papa that is not it said patty drawing out her pocket-handkerchief mamma has nothing whatever to do with it but my very heart is broken at thinking that i am in london and can't see the only friend i ever had in the world i should not mind anything if you would only let me go and call upon matilda perkins mr o'donagough threw a glance round the room and then at the personal decorations of his wife and daughter do you really wish patty to let your friends see you in this changed condition said he gravely but without harshness when they saw you last you looked like a duchess and now darling upon my word you look like her housemaid don't you think it would be better to wait till we are up again wait for three months papa without seeing matilda perkins i am sure it will kill me i am certain that i can't bear it and here patty applied her handkerchief to her eyes i wonder any man alive would ever rear a daughter sang mr o'donagough laughing and attempting to withdraw the handkerchief from the bright orbs he so greatly admired come patty don't be a fool look up and be a good girl and we'll contrive some way or other about seeing the perkinses but i must not have all my plots and plans spoiled either mind that if you please i am sure i don't want to spoil anything papa replied patty only let me see matilda and i'll tell her anything in the world that you like there's a darling very well patty you shall go with your mother and call upon them to-morrow morning if you will only you must dress yourselves nice and tell them that you came into town entirely to see them for that you are in lodgings at richmond till your london house is ready no no upon second thoughts you had better say that we are staying with friends at richmond or else perhaps they might expect to be invited do you understand patty yes papa perfectly and i shall like all that very much a great deal better than letting them suppose that we are actually living in such a place as this and nothing can be easier you know than telling them exactly whatever you please about it only i shan't at all get the sort of comfort i want if i am only to go once and have no place where i may tell matilda to call upon me in return it is my turn now said mrs o'donagough i have not said a word yet but if you will listen to me both of you i'll engage for it i will manage the business better than either and likely enough too my barnaby gaily replied her husband who for some reason or other had returned in excellent spirits likely enough patty shall beat us both at a plot so say your say mrs o d and let us see how we can contrive to let the beauty have her way without interfering with what i have laid down as firmly as the laws of the medes and persians well then donny i'll tell you what we must say to the perkinses first we'll begin by letting them know that we have been invited to stay with some very elegant friends at richmond and i can put in a word or two about our all enjoying it so very much and then we'll go on to say that there is but one drawback which is the inconvenience of the distance from town just at the time when we have so much to do in preparing a house for the winter and spring and then i can say that dear mr o'donagough is so dreadfully afraid of my being over-fatigued 
that he has taken a little bit of an out-of-the-way lodging just for us to sleep in whenever it happened that we were too much knocked up by a day's shopping to be able to return to richmond the same night and then you know nothing will be easier at any time than to fix a day for their calling by saying come monday come tuesday for we have made appointments with tradespeople which will oblige us to be in town well done barnaby exclaimed mr o'donagough slapping her on the back and laughing heartily isn't your mother a capital hand patty in that way my dear you may see this dear friend of yours three times in a week if you like it and i should not make the least objection observed mrs o'donagough to her passing a day or two at a time with them if they happened to invite her the change would do her a deal of good dear creature and the perkinses are such perfectly proper people that there could be no reason in the world against it this was an idea that made patty's eyes sparkle again as brightly as before they were rubbed by her pocket-handkerchief and with such a prospect before her and a delicious new novel called the doubtful one to fill up all mental interstices when her own meditations had been sufficiently indulged the day passed away without another sigh or groan being heard from her End of chapter nineteen